Well, hello again, and uh, we're back, yes, on the subject of Dr. Ranson. Um, things have been moving quite a lot. We're going to talk particularly about the FOIs that I put in mm. and uh, the responses. I, I, I don't know where we last talked about this, but initially the two that I put in had been declined. Mm. Uh, the, the second one being declined very much at the last minute. But anyway, we've now had a response on one. This is particularly about the Cabinet Office and what happened. Mm -hmm. um, it's been intriguing, to say the least, and we've got quite a lot of information there, even though they haven't responded that well, but they have responded. Mm -hmm. And you can you can start drawing more dots. You've been looking this closely. What's your take on what we know so far now? Well, I think it's important at this stage to step back. I don't know how many uh, sessions you and I have done on this now. Uh, it, it's <laughs> extraordinary. But if I can just step back for a moment or two and look at this in the much broader picture, what we're actually uh, witnessing here is, I wouldn't say a standoff, but a clash between the Attorney General's Office and the, just, and the judicial process mm -hmm. in its broadest sense. And the outcome of which is that it's been an absolute train crash for the Attorney General's Office. No doubt about that. Both appeals, the tribunal itself is part of the judicial process. So it's really been a, an awful uh, outcome for the Attorney General's Office. And those not familiar uh, with the goings-on in government might say, well, this, is this just a one-off? And I would say, no, it's not. Uh, and I would take you back, right back to the Wooler Report of over a decade ago. And in fact, the not yet seen review of that Wooler Report, which was supposed to be available to us now and, and isn't. And what we've seen is uh, an Attorney General's office growing ever more powerful over the years, more influential, more controlling, with a, a, a very, very deep pocket becoming an arrogant organisation. And why it's come out now is simply not because of COVID, but because, per se, but because somebody at last has stood up and said, I stand by my position and I'm going to see this right the way through and managed to get uh, f support from the BMA such that they were able to see the whole process through. On many occasions where people, as it were, fall foul of government, employees, etc., at others outside, that sort of money isn't available. So this case that you and I have spent so much time on uh, is shining a light on what's wrong with the way the Attorney General's Office works and the interaction between the Attorney General's Office and the political process. So that's. That's it in its broadest position. If we can now turn to the, the FOI response in particular. Right at the start, that's the second appeal. Mm -hmm. And do you remember though, looking back for a second again, you and I said very clearly after the tribunal produced its original um, delivery, its, its original decisions, that we said it would be stupid, we used those words, stupid. Um, in the extreme to go to appeal because the outcome f from the tribunal was so clearly cut in favour of Rosalind Ransom that it, it, would, it would be madness to go to appeal and yet they went to appeal. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to ask yourself the question, how can, how can the AG's office be so stupid when they're full of intelligent people? Well the answer to that I think is they are used to being able to uh, overuse their powers and have become arrogant and complacent. And that's now inculcated into the system, the way they operate, the way they advise departments, the way they advise Comin, and the way they <laughs> advise Timwald. So that, they, they arrived on the scene as it were, not ready uh, or even understanding what they were up against. And they were up against somebody who was going to stand up against them. Let's remember that second appeal they handed over to uh, Callum Wild. I think about two or three days before the appeals being heard. So they took our responsibilities for the government's side of things. So they shouldn't have been involved after that. But you have to remember that uh, no, they, the no. AG's department gives information. They sit in on Comin, don't they? You remember that? Yeah, 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 yeah. They're, they're part of that. So every time that Ross and Ranson came up, shouldn't from there onwards, the AG's excuse themselves if if they haven't already from any 
to recuse themselves. Yeah, because surely they well, could no, be they, conflicted, couldn't they? Well, they are, they are the all and everything to everybody and have adopted a culture and attitude um, accordingly. But um, with re specific regard to the second appeal, you've got to remember that it was the Attorney General's office that lodged that second appeal mm -hmm. with the courts. And then a matter of days later, I, don't, I, think it, I think they lodged it on the 4th of August, and by the 10th, mm -hmm. they'd stepped back and said, well, we're conflicted. The right thing to do at that stage would have been to say, well, actually, our lodgement of this with the courts, bearing in mind we're conflicted, should be withdrawn. But it, it, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we had that strange situation, actually, at that second appeal, where in Cal Wild, their lawyers said, we're not sure what we're, we're well, doing, which it almost seems quite strange because they were there obviously to do a job. But mm. I'm understanding that their, their recommendation was, let's not go okay. to second appeal. So I'm let's, jumping ahead here too much for you. Let, let's take it sort of methodically if we can. So the, the, uh, this stupid second appeal was lodged by a conflicted body, the Attorney General's office. It wasn't subsequently withdrawn. The the responsibility for representing the DHSC in this matter then fell to Calvin Wilde. Coming to your point, that when it came to the appeal itself, they stood up and said, well, we're not sure why we're here. So just bear that in mind, if you would, Paul, when we come back to the sequence of events surrounding the essence of your, your FOI report, uh, uh, sorry, response, I beg your pardon. So the, the matter relating to the Council of Ministers and the DHS's submission to them started on the 27th of September, if you recall. So on the 27th of September, the DHSC, uh, as it were, went to the Council of Ministers under the auspices of a paper saying, I, we don't know exactly what was said there, but we, we can reasonably assume that it was saying, well, which way should we go on this one? That's, that's the position. Now, you then put yourself in the Chief Minister's shoes here. He got that request from the DHSC on the evening of the 27th. I think it was about a quarter to six or something. So at the end of the working day, he was being asked by DHSC and effectively his brand new minister straight into the role a matter of days before. I was think it, it was totally on day five when he had to. Had so, to or had not to, to so sign that. Uh, a, brand, a brand new minister, yeah. brand new in the job, into a, a complex situation, reaching out to the Council of Ministers for advice, but then the Chief Minister finds himself in an ignominious position because he can't place that paper before the Council of Ministers because the Council of Ministers didn't sit till the Thursday, mm -hmm. but the appeal had to be finalised and lodged with its skeleton argument by, I think, four o'clock on the Wednesday. So I would put it to you that the, at that stage, the Chief Minister's sort of locked into a very difficult position. Brand new minister, big question to answer, no opportunity to do it in the way that perhaps he would have liked to have done. Mm -hmm. And bearing in mind that in normal circumstances, it would have gone to the Council of Ministers and legal advice, would, back to your point again, legal advice would have been offered by the Attorney General's office. So how on earth does the Chief Minister at that point find himself in a satisfactory position to give calm and cool advice to his new minister. Well, how, you say advice because he's not allowed to actually rule it. It wasn't it? an instruction or direction. I know the wording was very carefully. It was yeah. just, it was uh, yeah. advice. Let's use that yeah. word. Yeah. Um, Guidance. Guidance seemed better. Okay, gui but this is from the chief minister who right. should be, not really be involved in this at all. No. But so, that's thing but well. as chief minister, he must be very aware of the fact that he's got a brand new minister. Yeah. So, where does he get his legal advice from at that stage? Now, we've got legal professional privilege here in the sense that we don't know what Callum Wilde said to the department DHSC in terms of that submitted paper. Well, I understand, to try and get around that, I understand from what I've seen in documents that it was they were going for the, let's just get on with things. That's how I understand it. Hence, hence their response when they got into the actual court to say, wait, we're not wait, quite sure what do you mean? Doing. What do you mean, let's get on with things? In other words, to forget the second appeal. Well, I haven't seen, and that's, that advice from uh, Callum Wilde to DHSC is privileged and one has to respect that. But if you then scroll forward to the appeal itself when they said, we don't know why we're, we're here, here. Yeah. 
that would correlate, would it not, for, in a rational mind, to suggesting that Callum Wilde were not in favour. We can only surmise. But let's make that assumption, okay. because did Callum Wilde, um, on the 27th, in the paper on the 27th of September, Tuesday the 27th, say, oh no, go ahead with the appeal, only to say a short time later on this, is it the 6th of October? Well, we don't know why we're here. So, rationally, you can you can assume that the that Callum Wilde were uh, careful, I would guess, about yeah, the, way the advice. We're trading as now, carefully as we can here, by the way. Right. I hope I haven't overstepped okay. any marks, but we, we, we are in a minefield of legalities to some degree. Well, but well, we can talk extent. about things that FOI had been. And, well, and the, 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 the first appeal, the second appeal, the tribunal are over and done with. All that's left now is the matter of uh, remedy, right. which, which we're not touching okay. on here. I need to but just remind you. Hang on, let, let me just come back to where the Chief Minister found himself okay. on the evening of Tuesday, the 27th. Brand new minister, serious advice needed, no opportunity to do it. So rather than say I can't advise, and again, I'm only trying to read into this what a reasonable person might think happened, rather than turn around to the new minister and say I can't give you advice, he, according to the FOI response, gathered the chief secretary, um, his deputy chief minister and himself together to try to decide what guidance might be provided. And now I really get concerned because the only legal advice available to the chief minister on whether this appeal should go ahead or not is one of his own ministers who is a, a trained solicitor. I can only assume that the advice must have come from her. Where else could it have come from? Where else could the advice come from which said, go ahead with the appeal? If I'm wrong, then wash my mouth out with soap. But it ha that In your opinion, you think that's what happened? Yeah. yeah. It, 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 if, it, if it wasn't from, from Jane Poole Wilson, who was it from? Well, again, the AGs are still in there, aren't they? No, the, well, no, the AGs are conflicting. I, I know, but are they, they not... How, hang on a second. How <laughs> could the AGs possibly advise the Chief Minister in this circumstance? Because they were the body that originally submitted the appeal to the court and then stepped back and said, we're conflicted. Well, okay. They could have gone for independent legal advice. We don't know about that, potentially. They got gone to another law of, lawyer's firm, advocates. Well, but yes. we don't know. We're, well, we don't, do they? We I don't mean, know. maybe that would have been helpful if it had been in the response but to the FOI. You're getting there to the timeline of this whole proceedings here, I'm guessing. Yeah, it, well, it doesn't I mean, quite seem... Well, I, I am it, concerned well, about J. Paul Wilson's advice, if I'm right. Um, okay. And, then and again, that's... That's supposition on my supposition. part. Okay. And that is, if you look at J. Paul Wilson's history, as I understand it, and again, she can correct me if I'm wrong, is that she spent quite a significant amount of time as an in-house corporate uh, solicitor advising the corporation uh, with regard to their interest in a range of areas. Um, my supposition here is that she brought that mindset in and was, as it were, rather than seeing the broader issue, may have protected the corporation she now saw herself working for, mm -hmm. the government. In other words, she, she, her advice may well have been gone native and that's my I mean, position this, on this that. leaves the question though why are the council ministers getting involved in this this is a, a event well, between dhsc and a, a private individual as such or was an ex-member or you know staff member well, this, the, why well, is it why is it in, interested well, the whole uh, council I, of ministers to such a high level because because the chief minister had lost at that particular moment his previous dhsc minister hooper mm -hmm. who remember misbehaved, he laughed in the in the tribunal when he was asked to give evidence, do you remember he, that? He saw that, tell him off that, didn't he? Yes, and, and subsequently uh, shrugged his shoulders about the whole affair on the basis, well, it's just an employment matter and nothing to do with me. I mean, how dare he have said that? Because if you sc again scroll right back, um, he was involved in the Constitutional Legal and Justice Committee with me and Jane Poole Wilson and we considered and studied the, the oversized, overpowerful AG's department. Both Jane and, and uh, uh, Laurie Hooper were fully aware of the overburdening, overpowerful position of the AG's department. And subsequently, both of them were involved in the uh, 
Public Accounts Committee were looking at Rosalind Ransom's situation. So they were both highly well briefed, and yet Hooper mishandled it, lost his job as a, co I believe, as a consequence of that. Uh, you might be job making a chimney. Well, on what are the on why? On what other grounds would you have moved? I don't know. Not cheaper, but look, can, okay. I, can I just remind people? But then I know you're answering your question yeah. because. Then, then um, Rob Collister was brought in uh, late on days, you know, almost say hours before this. Oh, okay, that's again, why yeah. I believe he reached out to the Council of Ministers and wasn't able to get Council of Ministers advice because the Council of Ministers didn't sit till after mm -hmm. the the closure date on the second appeal, which was the four o'clock on the twenty eighth. I'm going to let you do those. I just suddenly realised it's really important for people who are not necessarily up to speed on what appeals with what. Is it OK? I just want to yeah, remind yeah. people, because it, it helps mm -hmm. me as well. The first appeal, August 2022, which DHSC uh, accused the tribunal of exceeding its remit by calling a disclosure hearing. I mean, you mm. remember that in itself. Mm. They didn't want that to happen. And that is one thing. That was uh, number one. Number two, although they actually were done in the opposite way around, the second appeal was filed before the first by... AG, but was heard on the 6th of October yeah. 2022. That's the one we're talking about. Yes. Yeah. DHSC claimed the tribunal could not order Anna Healy to give evidence on account of legal privilege, even though the tribunal had made it clear they did not expect her to divulge any information which was privileged. Correct. I mean, you know, this is just... Well, this, look, this the, is whole, the whole of the case seems to hang on to whether or not we have, should have concern about legal professional privilege. But that should have been killed stone dead right at the outset because the chairman of the tribunal, very experienced person, as was his panel, as was his committee, uh, at the tribunal rather, when he said, we have no intention, no, absolutely no intention at all, of breaching legal professional privilege. And yet it was the AGs who picked this up and started to hide behind it. Uh, their performance on this whole thing has been absolutely miserable. Now, politicians can start having a bum fight in Timwald if they want to over this. But in reality, if they don't look at the story behind this, if they don't pick up the Wooler report, if they don't reach out and say what on earth is, is happening with the review of the Wooler report, if they don't examine clearly the misbehaviour of the Attorney General's office, then the Attorney General's office will quietly sit back and watch politicians arguing amongst themselves, you know, trying to kick all sorts out of each other. I think, on, on I think we're at a tipping point, though. I really do believe, and, and especially with your sort of knowledge and determination to bring this out, I think, I think there's this a few This has been going people. on for me a long time. I know, time. but there's a few more. Anyway, look, yeah. let's get down to the actual day itself and the actual... Mm. We're going to, at four o'clock, that second appeal had to be in, right? As I Correct. understand it here, ALF, according to our Freedom of Information, had sent an email um, at 15... No, 1517. DHSC actioned it at 1527, so 10 minutes later, and bear in mind four o'clock's cut off time. And Minister Collister only afterwards apparently saw what was going on, and uh, I believe there was one at 1535, um, which basically, I think, if I'm, if I'm absolutely reading this right, and I think I am, um, Mr. Collister would have actually gone along with it. He didn't want to, I don't think, but I think he was going to play team member. Well, I don't know. I can only summarise, and I'm going from information that I can't disclose sources from. So, you know, and whatever happens, he would have signed off it, but it never got to him. This is where it troubles everyone, I think. It was signed off. Not that, It wasn't by the Chief Minister, because he can't sign it off. But someone in a department passed it to Callum Wilde to say, go for the second appeal. This is before four o'clock on that day, which is incredible well, if you think about it because that means it's, there's some rogue things going on here or at best you could say it was ill-advised or by an experienced officer who didn't know the, the rules I mean I'm trying to be helpful well, to them but I don't know inexperienced minister incomplete council of ministers arrogant conduct on the part of the attorney generals it, it's it's just and an, a really really ridiculously tight time scale that was involved here where you you had less than a day less than a day for the centre to come up with the advice that the Minister of DHSC had asked for. I mean, you could, honestly, honestly, Paul, you couldn't make this up. Again, it's just why desperate. would Alf Cannon want to be involved 
at all in this thing? Well, if, I, if it's if it's just as simple as it seems, I mean, well, it, I've answered, it begs I've, more I've, questions I've, than answers. I've answered that because he will have felt a, a duty and an obligation. I presume. I mean, this is my these yeah. are my suppositions. He would have felt a. a, a, a um, a concern for his brand new minister who was thrown into this and trying to find uh, his feet literally within a matter of hours. Um, so how could he possibly turn away from his minister and say, no, it's a matter for you, you decide. I mean, it, it's, it beggars belief. But what I think is important, and this is what worries me, in the reply, it says here, uh, please see below the response from the Chief Minister. I'm going to read the Chief Minister's response out. I have read the information provided. That was on the paper, right, mm -hmm. delivered by the department. We don't know who it's gone to do it because it's been redacted. If, it? well, this is his advice. Where would he send it to? Yeah, no, but I'm saying... If it is, if, if, he says, if it is the case that future legal advice provided to government departments may not or cannot be heard and under privacy, then it is my view that the appeal should proceed on a point of principle. So that statement itself is a fair statement, but it doesn't relate to this case because there was never any question of legal professional privilege being breached by the tribunal or anybody else come to that. What it was all about was the AG's department making a complete dog's dinner of the whole of the tribunal because for once they're, they're caught out, mm -hmm. for once somebody stands up to them and they've used all and every trick in their book to try to dodge the bullets. And here the Chief Minister's left in a position where he hasn't even got the advice of his Attorney General. I mean, I don't know, you and I don't know what happened in that meeting between the Chief Secretary, the Deputy Chief Minister and the Chief Minister, but they were in a, a difficult position and came up with absolutely the wrong conclusion because it was self-evident to you and I very much earlier on than this, as I recall anyway, that the tribunal has said, look, no question here of, of uh, breaching uh, professional legal uh, privilege at all. It wasn't an issue. It was a, uh, forgive the use of the word, it was a concocted IB idea by the AG's department on the 4th of August that somehow it was. What did the judiciary do? They wiped the floor effectively with the, the AG's department. The tri on two occasions, the tribunal have wiped the floor with the AG, in fact, through, with the AG's department, in expressing their concerns about the lack of documentation, the late documentation, the very late com, uh, mm -hmm. uh, documentation, the possibility of concocted documents. You know, how close can you get to scathing? And no wonder we're in the realm of uh, uh, special damages, in, in consideration of special damages, indicating a, a degree of punishment to government. Now I hope and I plead with members of Timwell, stop bomb fighting amongst the, yourselves and get to grip, grips once and for all, with the totally unacceptable, uh, powerful, arrogant, aggressive organisation that is the AG's department. Because remember, it's not just the AG's department the area dealing with departmental stuff. They are the legal advisors of a, shall we say, misuse a phrase, a, a huge corporation, the government. Oh, man, PLC. With, yeah. a, with a billion pound uh, expenditure line each mm -hmm. year. AG's departments are also responsible for looking at uh, contractual issues between individual companies and the government. If they can't be trusted here, let me say this, they are not to be trusted when it comes to contractual matters between individual companies and government. Goodness me, Tim, we'll get a grip of this once and for all. So we all see FOIs and they were turned down because they were claiming privilege and luckily with my advice I went back and suddenly this, this no. week we get this bit released. No, so it, was, it was, I think one of the reasons given was, was uh, uh, they were forming policy. Well, they weren't forming. Yeah, but policy. also legal privilege was pushed in there. But anyway, the thing is, they've come back this week after my first, you know, mm. retort. They've come back with something. So a week later, something has come back. But it just is interesting now. Uh, maybe I'm jumping too far ahead. You maybe got more to say. But Claire Christian has, is trying to put some a question down at least for Timwald 
and we're recording this on Tuesday, so it's going to be a week mm-hmm. from now. By the way, as we record this in the afternoon, we still haven't found the order, the uh, question paper, which is, mm-hmm. I think, unusual, to see if it's allowed. But she's basically asking the same sort of questions to the Chief Minister next week. Do you think that's tied up with him releasing this almost to us now? Is, 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 do you think I, I, I don't know. I haven't spoken to Claire about this. No. But um, I, I think from what I've already said to you, I'm very anxious that we don't end up with a with this a ridiculous bun fight over he said, she said stuff. And once and for all recognise that Tim Wall's duty here is to say, okay, where is that Wooler report on the eight? Where is it? Mm -hmm. Remember that Wooler report I read 10 years ago was shocking, shocking report. Mm -hmm. Never came public. It was summarised in a sort of executive uh, issue. Uh, Steve Wooler's done a review, still isn't out. Timble's duty now is to grip this with both hands and say, how, how are we going to put ourselves in a position where this overpowerful organisation is so misbehaving and, oh, by the way, includes within its uh, area of, of responsibilities the prosecution service? I mean, you know, you couldn't make this up. Can I go back to Claire Christian? Because this yeah. is well, st- I did. I was, I was yeah, but the point is, what... Her, her, up to, she said on Twitter last couple of days that her questions at that stage were being declined. The, the president has said it couldn't be done because you know what's going to come next. Oh, so do <laughs> So I pointed out to us, I mean, I wasn't the only one, I'm, I'm not a legal bill, but obviously certain things are now in the public domain and you can ask questions as far as I'm aware. But you have to remember that surely the president is getting his advice from the, the AGs. AGs. Yeah. But they're conflicted, aren't they, again, on this? Because well, it's, it's a question that could bring them into something. Well, so I mean, if you, should they not I, go I, to an independent advice? I mean, maybe they did, maybe they didn't. Well, I don't know. I was, I'm just go, go back to one of our uh, other uh, series of, of sessions that we've done together on this one, and that, the Expol report. Remember how everything's subjudice until it's not because it suits the AG's department. Remember mm-hmm. that? And oh, well, you know, out comes Let's the report. The Expol, out there. the Expol report says nothing to see here, so out it comes. Yeah. But when there's a possibility of of serious uh, consideration on matters which might embarrass them. Well, I know it's sub I, I, For my part, I don't see how it is sub no. But as you say, the, the uh, president is advised by the AG. So this is what could happen on Tuesday. Someone might say that the AG cannot be involved in this particular question because well, just conf- that's conf- what should happen. Yeah, well, maybe this will happen. Maybe I, I'm not saying. Also... Well, no, I think you're right in the sense that... that uh, if the AG is, AG's advice here is conflicted, and it is, he wanted the you know, appeal. Any, Wait a minute. Yeah, okay. the, and, and the president is, it, is in the same sort of dichotomy that the chief minister was, that there was nobody there to advise him. My God, how many times can we point at the same problem? Then the president needs to take, as you've just said, advice external from the AG. Because next week, there could be that moment when the president has to go, oh, that's subjudice. And where that, you know, and, and it may not be, but then it may be, but it's just making this thing honest, clear and transparent, isn't it? Which yeah. is what these things well, were the same. OK, so here's now what I'm hearing. This is this. Is, and I cannot back this up in the sense of I've got a piece of paper to say it, but my phone. What been, are you going to say? My tomorrow? phone has been like crazy and, and emails. I'm getting sent stuff. And thank you, by the way, because this no. I, again, this subject I has not touched anyone as much as it has you and me. And I know um, Claire. Christian, who's asking the question, she's she's miffed, and that's putting it politely, because this whole thing hasn't added up for a long time, and it's now time for clarity, right? So the Chief Minister is going to be asked X, Y, and Z, basically what Ivory asked in that thing, because he's in, in Timwald, he's got privilege, and he could answer, t- to some degree, some of these things. But there's two ways it's, it's going to go. He will either answer it, knowing that Claire's got the sub-questions to go, yeah, mm-hmm. and he doesn't know where they're going to lead to. Or, and this is what I'm hearing as a potential option that's been considered, that he will hold his hands up and say, I made a mistake or we made a mistake and, and you know, it shouldn't have happened, which is something. And let's move on. Interesting What thought. shouldn't have happened, sorry? Well, that he shouldn't have sent the emails and done that and, and be not been signed off by the right person for that second appeal. Now, oh, you with me? Mm. So that's what I'm hearing. I mean... By the time you watch this and it's gone next well, Tuesday, you'll know what's happened. But anyway, it's a, as described in our walk through this. It's a it's a pretty hopeless situation, and comes down to the concept that the AG is all influential, all powerful, and it's got to stop. Mem- go back to something I've said ages ago and many times to, to to you know to the point of boring people to death. 
that I've always argued vociferously that members should have independent legal advice. It's crazy that they haven't. And the, the way they misuse the role of um, Solicitor General to ensure the very thing that one, we wanted didn't happen was just disgraceful. So this is a long-running saga started that started more than 10 years ago. And here we are, it, it bursting out like a, a devil incarnate. It's, it's awful. But le members of Timwald, look at what you need to look at and don't get overexcited about the, the issue of the moment. This is a really, really serious matter. I've had more reaction to this since my COVID um, you know, Q&A things. You know, people coming mm. up to me, have you had that response? People are mm. interested in this, are they? Well, uh, or are we just talking to ourselves and no one's, no one's bothered? No, that's not happening. I, I probably had more feedback on this than I did when it was an MHK. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, really? I oh mean, it, it, I can hardly go to the shops which, without somebody saying... Which shows that it has to be dealt with. This is not going to go away, is it? This, well, is, this is not going to play well. Again, I keep saying that thing, but it, it can be sorted. Yeah, well, why, would it, why would it, apart from the things that I've discussed about mm. the ages, why would it start to come, as it were, to, to the surface in such a... Um, what, what was it Claudius, the Emperor Claudius said? He said... Uh, because he, he stuttered, didn't he? There was a great mm. play, I, Claudius, years ago. He said, oh, yes. He said, let, let, let all the evils in the mud hatch out. I mean, that's what he said. You'll get lessons about your thing there, Bob. You know? And that, that, well, that's fine. Yeah. But I'm only mimicking what yeah. uh, was, was yeah. uh, done in a, in a play. But that's what we're getting now. The, these things have got to be dealt with, and, and they haven't been. Uh, and I... I feel sort of a sympathy for everybody now getting dragged down by this because we're in such a, a messy situation born out of the issues that we've raised. Yeah well you know just doing those things I did those three that three part and just me reading the camera from the yeah, advice. Yeah. Well done. It, it just kind of as you read it you're going oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. so many things that just don't make sense or don't to us anyway and as you said it, it, it looks like it's protecting the powerful it it seems well, the, to me this is the powerful being here, the corporate body, which is because it's more than one, but the corporate body, the government, over powerful, still growing, mm. getting more expensive, having this sort of monopoly of, of legal advice control with no opportunity for members to, to question. And a lot of members come in, as it were, and I use this phrase uh, kind, in a kindly way, ignorant of a lot of these issues and they have to learn them, which is why we set up the Constitutional Legal and Justice Committee. And what's disappointing here is both that uh, Laurie Hooper and, and Claire and, and uh, Jane Poole Wilson were both on that committee with me and n know the weaknesses inherent in this and seem blithely willing to, to ignore them. I, I don't get it. Okay, well, obviously we'll see now Tuesday, uh, Tim will sitting, uh, still, as, as I speak, we still haven't got the, the actual question paper up there, but uh, time will tell. Thanks again, and we'll, mm. we'll keep going.